All right, it's my pleasure to introduce Amber Johnson. She is a PhD student at the University of Maine, advised by Dr. Debbie Bouchard and working collaboratively with the USDA ARS National Cold Water Marine Aquaculture Center. Previously, um, and you may recognize her from the summer seminars in the past, she was uh, she earned her bachelor's and master's degrees in Dr. Tom Locke's lab at Michigan State University, where she found a passion for all things viruses and cell culture. And it's exciting to see that work continue. Heck yeah, it is. All right. <laughs> so I'll go ahead and get started here. Thank you for the introduction. Um, if you saw my talk last week or I had the chance to talk with you at the fish health section meeting, I apologize, but this is all going to look very, very familiar, but maybe you'll have some new questions. So I'll get going anyways. Uh, to kick things off, the Atlantic salmon is a significant cultured fin fish globally, wherein fish are typically cultured via some combination of recirculating and net pen systems shown here. And the USCA ARS is ongoingly supporting salmon at aquaculture via their establishment of an Atlantic salmon breeding program. So here fish are genotyped, bred selectively based on ideal phenotypes, such as enhanced growth and resistance to sea lice. So similar to the culture of any other fin fish species, the Atlantic salmon industry is susceptible to losses due to diseases. One of the most infamous or notorious being infection salmon anemia caused by infectious salmon anemia virus. So first described in the late 1980s and later reported in the US in the early 2000s, the virus not only causes severe clinical disease, but is also one of the most intensively managed and regulated aquaculture pathogens due to its capacity to create epizootics. So while these individual detection events often don't result in acute 100% cumulative percent mortality, affected lots typically need to be depopulated depending on the region where it's found. And in that regard, a loss is a loss. Just quick check, are my slides going okay so far? Anything at all? Yay, nay. It looks good. Yep. Okay, perfect. So, so kind of in that regard, um, concurrent with the expansion of our selective breeding program, our understanding of how ISAV interacts with the host on a genomic level is being uncovered with current literature, some shown here, supporting the hypothesis that there is indeed a heritable genetic-based component to ISAV resistance. So that's when we began to develop our research questions and objectives. So we wanted to accomplish two big things here. First, we wanted to determine if there appeared to be any incidental differences in ISAV susceptibility amongst fish in our selective breeding program when compared to randomly bred fish. So the USDA has been selectively breeding Atlantics for over two decades now. And while none of those efforts have focused on ISAV resistance, given what we're now learning regarding genetic resistance, it was important to us to understand if our methods had imp impacted resistance one way or another. Further, if there were differences between any families, selectively bred or not, we wanted to begin to understand how our salmon are responding to ISAV by investigating what's happening in terms of viral loads in the host transcriptome. Full disclosure, the latter of these two things is still very much underway, but I'll be talking about what we found so far. So moving into methods, we needed this experiment to accomplish two big things here in order to answer our questions. We first needed a way to look at family mortality and survival to compare selectively versus randomly bred fish. And moving into our second question, we needed a way to look at viral loads and host response to compare what could be happening differently amongst these families. So moving into our methods and be, again, staying in that vein, before I get into exactly what this experiment consisted of, you just saw some photos of our facility, but I'm showing another one here of our challenge setup. So that included 21 recirculating tanks. And much like Debbie highlighted before, our facility is capable of operating at biosafety level three standards, which is not only unique in ter terms of aquaculture research facilities, but it also highlights that we operate with an excess of caution when working with this pathogen. But moving into the fish themselves, um, this study, we use 872 non-vaccinated Atlantic salmon smolts. These fish were identified via pit tags and were made up equally of 40 different families, including 10 randomly bred and 30 selectively bred families used in our breeding program. So to begin investigating mortality and survival between families, we started with 16 tanks, each including one fish per family, so 40 fish per tank. And to expose these fish to ISAV, we used a cohabitation model where 10 of the 40 fish were injected on day zero with the Charlie Cove Back Bay ISAV isolate and placed back into the tanks with the remaining 30. 
So to ensure we weren't injecting the same 10 families in these tanks over and over again, I'd mentioned before these fish were pit tagged. So we had a challenge matrix set up and that we had four separate groups where in 10 different families were injected in each of those groups, highlighted in red. So we next needed a means of collecting fresh tissue from fish representing all 40 families. And to do that, we had a few stipulations. First, we wanted all of these fish to have identical exposure routes, given we intended to use these tissues for very sensitive assays or things such as transcriptomics. We also wanted to have fresh collected tissue. For a lot of these things, fresh tissue is the best tissue. So to do this, we started with four additional tanks, again, each containing one fish per family, except we exposed these tanks to ISAV via the addition and injection of eight non-specific family origin fish with ISAV on day zero. And they were placed into the tank to expose the remaining fish via cohabitation. So these tanks were then assigned a specific sampling day, at which point the entire tank was euthanized and sampled at their respective time point. And lastly, given this was a recirculating system to ensure we didn't have virus freely circulating throughout any of our tanks, we maintained and sampled the Sentinel control tank throughout the duration of this study. So what do we do with these samples? So for the mortalities, we collected spleen, heart, and kidney for virus reisolation and RT-QPCR. And for our sampling tanks, we collected spleen, gill, kidney, and heart for, again, QPCR and soon-to-be transcriptomics. Moving into what we found, first and foremost, we did induce clinical disease in these fish, wherein mortalities exhibited clinical ISAV, especially including internal and external hemorrhaging shown here. We did also successfully re-isolate virus from affected mortalities. And looking at that mortality now for the first group of 16 tanks, I'm showing you a survival analysis with probability of survival on the y-axis and days post-exposure on the x. And you'll see we saw consistent mortality starting at around 10 days post-exposure, culminating in 56% cumulative percent mortality. So we next wanted to examine if our injected and cohabitated fish were responding differently to virus infection. And to do that, we compared survival curves from these two groups using the log rank test, which weights deaths equally across the entire study. And given apparent differences in mortality timing, as you can see here, we also utilized the grehan breslow wilcoxon test, which placed heavier weights on deaths that occur earlier, earlier on. So we immediately appreciated that there were no significant differences when using the log rank test. However, the curves were indeed different using the Wilcoxon test. And with that, we deduced that there was a difference in disease timing, but there was no significant difference in outcome between these two exposure routes. So given that there were no difference really in disease outcomes, we were able to combine injected and cohabitated fish for endpoint analyses, such as cumulative percent mortality analysis. So I'm showing you that data here now with cumulative percent mortality on the y-axis and family number on the x. And as you can see, there's a very large spread of mortality here with our randomly bred fish, now highlighted in blue, falling amongst and within the gradient of selectively bred fish. So to analyze these samples statistically, we combined and compared the random and selectively bred families respectively and conducted another survival analysis, wherein we appreciated no significant differences between groups. And further, when looking at cumulative percent mortality averages between the 10 random and 30 selectively bred families, we also noted no significant differences. So going back to the question at hand, our data suggests that there were no significant differences in survival between our control and selectively bred families, our randomly bred and selectively bred families, suggesting no incidental impact on ISAV resistance. However, we did see a very large spread of mortality between these families and sought to begin answering our second question, if or how are resistant and susceptible families responding to ISAV differently? So to do that, we first identified a subsection of well and poor performing fish highlighted here. We then compared the groups of families to each other and immediately noted significant survival differences between the groups. Similarly, we have probability of survival on the y-axis and days post-exposure on the x. And this wasn't necessarily surprising given the cumulative percent mortalities. However, we did want to investigate that closer by examining viral loads. So to do that, we needed to determine which of the four sampling tissues collected, spleen, gill, kidney, or heart, served as the best tissue for virus detection via qPCR. So I'm now showing you a graph with log fold copies of virus per milligram of tissue on the y-axis and the tissue type on the x. And via t-test, we determined that viral loads in the spleen were significantly higher or equal to that in the other three organs. So we decided to use that organ for analyses moving forward. <laughs> 
I also want to highlight that these samples consisted of organs taken, taken across all four time points and culminated in over 200 samples per individual tissue type. So now what I'm showing you here is a comparison of viral loads between resistant R and susceptible S families across the four sampling days. So immediately we noted no significant differences in viral loads between these groups here. If you look from day 11, 21, 35, and 49, while there are changes between the days themselves, within those days there appeared to be no significant differences between the two groups of families. So I now have overlaid infection prevalence. So the number of positive um, fish that we identified via qPCR over the total number screened. And you'll see there really aren't many differences there either. Slight differences on day 21, but both of these groups, susceptible and resistant, reached 100% infection prevalence by day 35 and day 49. So again, I just want everyone to hang on to this idea that there appeared to be no differences in viral loads based on these time points. And circling back to our original question regarding if susceptible and resistant families are responding differently and how, in brief, our data here suggests in terms of survival, yes, that's how we kind of marketed them as resistant and susceptible. But in terms of viral load, based on these time points, our current data suggests no differences between these families. So looking at some of the big picture takeaways here, the first conclusion we drew from this is that ISAV susceptibility has not been affected through our selective breeding methods. This is good news to us. Um, as many of you know, if you're in the selective breeding game, sometimes selecting for one ideal trait could result in the emergence of added non-ideal traits. And that was good to see that that was not what was going on here. Further, while there were no differences between random and selectively bred families, we did appreciate differences between families overall, selectively bred or not. And while this idea is not necessarily novel, it does support previous hypotheses and literature suggesting potential heritable resistance to ISAV. And it was important to us to determine if we saw similar trends with our fish here. So lastly, data collected here showed us that differences in mortality between resistant and susceptible families do not appear to translate into differences in viral loads. So I'm going to focus in on that a little bit more. Uh, this was super interesting to us because we saw very clear differences in survival. I mean, families with 25% cumulative percent mortality all the way up to 94, but those differences were not reflected in viral loads when we looked at these time points. So you know that something is happening here that determines whether or not a fish will succumb to disease or infection, but we now have a possible lead that that quote unquote something appears to focus more on host damage control or management of symptoms, mitigation of disease signs, as opposed to the suppression of viral replication itself. Uh, as we speak, we have samples being processed for transcriptomics. I should have that data back in a couple of weeks. So with that, we can hopefully expand on this a little bit more and begin to deepen our understanding of how our fish are responding to ISAV. And with that, we open up the doors to do so much more. I said this last week, but um, the good thing about being so early in a program is that the possibilities and questions are seemingly endless right now. So if y'all just stay tuned, I hope to have a lot more to share on that in the coming years. I know I'm past time, I'm sorry, but I do just want to acknowledge all the people that made all this research possible, including the NACA that I'm funded by between University of Maine and ARS, as well as my advisor, Dr. Debbie Bouchard. Um, I'll take any questions if I have time, if not, my email's there, so. <laughs> Excellent presentation. And we'll give you a chance for a quick one. If someone has it, feel free to unmute yourself or drop it into the chat. Hi, Amber. Uh, I have a question or a uh, comment. Is this not the tolerance, not the resistance, what you are talking about? Yeah, so I haven't really dove, like kind of dove into like the differences between those two things. But I mean, that's a good point to bring up. I mean, because they they both seem to be having or harboring the same amount of virus. So maybe one of these families is just tolerating it better than the other. Um, and that's, again, good point. And that's what we kind of hope to uncover when we look at the transcriptome data is to see how they are tolerating it better. Like, how are these quote unquote resistant or quote unquote susceptible families behaving differently here? So. Thank yes. you. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thanks again, Amber. Great talk. Awesome. Thank you.